Hi everyone, uh, so it's hello from me here in Nova Scotia, where it's currently threatening to snow outside, it keeps changing its mind though. Um, if you could begin just by saying hi in the live comments and maybe just mention where you're watching from as well. And also let me know if you can see and hear me okay, uh, that always helps a little bit. So welcome to week four of how to think like a Roman emperor and to the, the live webinar. Let me just rearrange things a little bit here on my screen so I can see what I'm doing better. Uh, so the agenda for today is, we've done the introductions, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping information, uh, then we'll look at the discussions as always from the previous week, from week three, which is about coping with pain, and then we'll do a preview of week four, which is about coping with loss, basically. And then I'll have a look at the live chat questions. So as always, there's about a 30 second delay, I think, um, between me saying something and you guys seeing it. So there's a little bit of delay if you message me. I don't look that much at the live chat while I'm presenting, but I'll go back and have a look at the end. If you want to address a question to me, it's much easier if you put at Donald at the beginning, and then uh, it's easier for me to spot it, especially if there's a lot of stuff going on in the live chat. So other practical stuff for this week. Um, there's a brief feedback form, uh, which I'd like people to complete if they haven't done so already. And then that helps me, if you do it during the course, then I'll try and kind of adapt to it. Although there's usually not a lot of things uh, that I need to change, but it's useful to get your feedback during the process. There will be another webinar. I keep forgetting this. There's five webinars. For some reason, I, keep, I seem to think there's four. There's five webinars because there's one next week as well because I have to kind of recap what happened in week four, don't I? And look at your discussion questions and comment on them as I usually do and then maybe talk about the, the course in general and, and the, a roundup of the final feedback. And after, uh, yeah, usually at the end of the course I do a, an ask me anything about Marcus at Aurelius in the, the Facebook group uh, maybe I'll, will I do it at the end of the course? I'll do it at the end of the course. I'll save that until the end of the course. And we'll, like, I'll post that in there. You can just hit me with any remaining questions that you have in the Facebook group. Um, other news uh, you might be interested in. I sent the manuscript of my new book in Marcus Aurelius to the publisher recently. So I'm now working on a couple of courses about Socrates, which you might be interested to know. So let me have a quick look. Nice guitars. Yeah, they're not mine. Um, someone in Wilfred in Nova Scotia, cool. New York, uh, Pennsylvania, cool. Hi, so I guess you can all hear me okay and stuff. Right, the course feedback, um, I'll just talk about very briefly. Uh, the, they're, they're very simple quantitative measures and then there's a section for pros and cons of the course and qualitative feedback. The scores are very high. Um, I think, actually I haven't checked, but I think they're slightly higher than they were for the pilot version, which is good because I've tried to improve it a little bit. So for clarity of the content, like how easy it is to follow and stuff, you the feedback scores are 97%, which is as high as we could realistically hope. Um, impact, like how useful it is, it's 93%. And also feasibility, uh, which is mainly down to the platform, it's down to Teachable, like the accessibility and so on, we've got 93% for that as well. So I those are about as high as we could realistically hope for. So that's cool, we don't need to do that much more to the, the course, but I will continue adding to it and improving it. I've got a bunch of other stuff that I can potentially include, um, which kind of leads me on to the verbal qualitative feedback because like one person had said there's almost too much content in week one and actually that was something that people had mentioned in the pilot version and that was because week one originally was uh, just about anger, it's, it's one on anger isn't it? But then I realised that I probably need to include an introduction to stoicism as well so it kind of got padded out with additional content and it is the longest week, actually. I've, since the pilot, broken it down a little bit, so it's not as onerous as it was. Um, 
but I'll probably revise it again and try and make it a little bit easier for people to get through in week one. I'll split the content up a little bit more. There's a kind of, there, there are some people who want there to be more content. There's some people who want there to be less content. So in the spirit of trying to have my cake and eat it, what I usually do is have a bonus section that I try and keep separate. And then if people want more content, I can say, go look in the bonus section. But if people feel there's a lot to get through, I can say, yeah, you can just skip that and come back to it at a later date. So try and keep everybody happy that way. Uh, someone else had said the table of content, the page, which I think they meant the table of contents in Teachable, could have more structure because it's just kind of grouped by week. Maybe, I, I don't think we can actually do that in terms of the software, unfortunately. But I will have a look at it. I do try and, if something's a video, I'll put the word video at the beginning. And if it's audio, I'll put audio at the beginning. So that makes it a little bit easier to navigate. And it is broken down into weeks. And also we, we didn't do this in the pilot, but we separated the bonus section into separate sections in the table of contents now as well. So it's kind of evolving a little bit. Maybe there's something else I can do to it. It's a little bit limited though. So now this is interesting. Somebody said it would be good to have the course on an app and someone else specified they'd like it on an Android app. Now, those are kind of two slightly different things. It may be that both people were asking about Android. There isn't an Android app at the moment. There is an iPhone app though. So if you use an iPad or an iPhone, the, there's an iOS app that you can download and there's a link to it on the main e-learning page, it's in the menu at the top. This course wasn't working briefly, or it was blocked actually by Apple, um, because they blocked all teachable courses from the app uh, that were paid, and they only allowed free courses because Apple had changed their policy for the App Store. But Teachable, who provide the software, had negotiated with them and they recently got them to reverse that decision. So this course will now work in the iPhone app. In terms of Android, the only thing I can suggest is it's down to when Teachable develop one, but the, I think the site is responsive, so it may like work okay um, in a, an Android browser, in the Chrome browser in Android. Um, I haven't looked to see what it looks like, but it might, it might be responsive and change a little bit and be accessible, but there isn't an app for Android. Um, somebody said they wanted more audio recordings of all sections. There's two audio recordings in week four, incidentally, uh, plus an, an audio exercise. Uh, I can do that. It takes a little bit of time to do recordings and stuff. Um, I think I've done round about half of them, um, but I'm going to continue to add more. Someone mentioned they'd like to see more about action in Stoicism. So I might try to include more on valued living. I seem to keep mentioning that it would be cool. I guess I can't quite figure out how to fit it in in terms of the topics um, but like I'll I'll have a think about it and see if I can add like a, a page that's about it although I'm also kind of wary about expanding the course too much because some people had suggested they wanted it condensed or abbreviated a little bit more uh, so again try and have our cake and eat it somehow uh, people had also said a lot of positive things in the feedback, which I usually don't mention or dwell on, but I suppose I should say that people said a lot of nice things. And they said they liked the historical context, making it easier to understand the philosophy. Uh, so I kind of delivered on that promise, I hope. And they thought the structure was clear and there was good organisation, which is good because it's kind of been evolving. So at least this, the structure has managed to, to, to like stay together to some extent. Uh, yeah, like that, that was my inspiration for doing the whole course really was that I think, and I'm, I mentioned this because I'm going to come back to it uh, later in the discussion today, that the way the historical context allows us to get more out of the meditations, like if you really love the meditations approaching it in this way, I think, I'm convinced, allows you to kind of get even more out of it, like twice as much out of it. I get um, like... I, twice as much out of the meditations now as I did when I first read it um, because there were passages before that I just didn't understand and I guess I skimmed over or there were passages that I didn't, hadn't really understood the, um, the structure of um, in terms of Marcus's use of technical concepts. And, and so I kind of unraveled that, you know, I kept like look at the Greek more closely now. Marcus's Greek's a little bit difficult. 
And I also get a lot more of it now because of my understanding of the historical context and Marcus's biography. Uh, so there are passages I'm like, I immediately there, either I understand what he means more or it kind of has more of an impact and it's more memorable because it resonates with me more. I'll, we'll look at some examples of that today from the, the comments that, that you participants and students have made. So discussing pain and illness, like I kind of feel like whenever I come to one of these topics, I'm like, yeah, this is one of my favorite subjects. Pain and illness is, yeah, it really interests me. Um, I wasn't an expert on pain and illness as a therapist. I worked with pain a bit over the years. I trained other therapists in pain management techniques. Uh, my specialism is anxiety though, but I, I, pain is kind of related to anxiety um, in terms of treatment strategies. So kind of interests me. We had that excerpt from Marcus Aurelius about Apollonius of Chalcedon and Claudius Maximus. And yeah, they're really interesting. So people might have just glossed over that. There's some interesting stuff in there just about those two guys. Stoics that he really admired, but different people. Apollonius was a professional lecturer who came from Greece. Uh, Maximus, his other Stoic tutor, is a more mysterious figure. He died and probably while Marcus was Caesar, I think. Um, but he was seems to have been a very accomplished military general and a, a Roman statesman. So he was probably more like a personal mentor or tutor to Marcus. An older man, very accomplished in politics, the military that, that Marcus looked up to and saw as a stoic role model. I, I would love to know more about both of those guys. Um, for some reason particularly, I mean, I'd love to know more about Claudius Maximus, but we got very small references to him in the literature. Cool, yeah, Teachable Works Good in Android, that's good to know. So the comments that you folks had made were as follows. Someone, Chris had talked about, was, it, was the stuff all written at once? Um, and he mentioned he's gaining more appreciation of book one by understanding more about who these people actually were and the significance of some of the things that Marcus says. Book one is now hands down my, f my favorite book in the meditations. It's, it's almost like a preface that people skip over. We think it was probably, the scholars believe it was probably actually written last and then put at the front. Um, it, it's the most biographical, obviously, by far. Not the only biographical bit in the meditations in the sense of talking about his life and, and friends and stuff, but the most obviously one. So it tell, that's where we can delve. And it, it, it's really interesting to see how it relates to what we're told in the Roman histories. By the way, if you haven't looked at the ebook, um, Marcus Aurelius and the Roman Histories, I'd suggest that you download that and read it because those excerpts are relatively short, they're fairly easy to read and if you are interested in book one and then you compare that to what Cassius Dio, Herodian, um, uh, Julius Capitolinus is it, the author of the Historia Augusta, it's probably not even his real name, but those guys, what those guys say about Marcus, it's interesting to see how it kind of dovetails with the stuff that he says about um, his friends, uh, his tutors, his family in book one. So I'm glad Chris had mentioned this kind of getting more appreciation out of that part of the meditations. Was it all written at once? Um, I There's actually a clue. The, the, this is an interesting example of what we can get by looking very closely at the text, right? Because there's a clue there. Um, the, the stuff he writes about Antoninus Pius, who's the person he says most about, um, inevitably, in a sense, his adoptive father, the preceding emperor, someone that Marcus, to whom Marcus served as right hand man for about 20 years. It's a hugely important relationship. Although Antoninus Pius wasn't, almost certainly wasn't a Stoic, uh, Marcus saw him as embodying, almost naturally embodying Stoic virtues. Now, there's at least one other passage later in the meditations where Marcus goes through a list of Antoninus's virtues. And they're, they're, they're kind of similar, but different to the ones that he lists in book one. And that proves 
the this is something that he did more than once um so it was, it was kind of like a, a contemplative exercise that he returned to and if he does it more than once in the meditations you you might speculate that he'd probably done it a bunch of times and who knows how many you know maybe he did it on a regular basis but it it wasn't like a one-off thing that he sat and drew this list and the lists that he drew up probably differed a bit each time that he did them and so that long list about Antoninus in particular, it does look like a lot of thought and effort's gone into it. He's not just kind of writing off the cuff, you know, he's done this before, like, and he spent a lot of time thinking about it and verbalising it. Maybe he's even discussed it with these tutors, I, I would speculate. Marcus, by the way, um, how much did he write? Uh, there's some hints that he wrote some other stuff. It's hard to tell whether the references and histories are to the meditations or to some other stuff that he wrote. We're told he wrote a book of exhortations that he read in public. There's some disagreement about whether that refers to the meditations or not. But actually, he must have written tons of stuff in in terms of speeches and he almost certainly wrote a lot of letters we don't know much about we know he wrote letters to Fronto he must have written to Junius Rusticus and to the other story tutors that he knew and you know if only we could see what was in those letters so a little aside so was it all written at once I doubt it um Gail had mentioned making an edited, or she'd actually kind of started making an edited list of the virtues of Apollonius and, and uh, Claudius Maximus. And she, she asked about five of them, I think. Oh, and this leads me to another kind of general, almost a housekeeping comment, which is if you go back and look at the preceding week's discussion, like, you know, when you commented on it, uh, and then moved on. There were probably people behind you in the course who hadn't commented. So it's useful to kind of go back and look at the earlier discussions. If you go back and look at the week three stuff, you'll see other people have probably commented and, and I'll have responded uh, probably since you were last there to some of the comments that people posted. So Gail had put that list in, which I think is very useful. I've always found it interesting and very useful when people do that. Um, some of them... See, this is an area of uncertainty as well. Like some of those virtues that Marcus attributes to these guys look like they're kind of quite personal observations, if you like. But some of them are clearly um, really generic uh, in the sense that they're familiar Stoic principles. And that doesn't mean that Marcus is being abstract. It means he's looking at these guys and he's like, you embody one of the fundamental principles of stoicism i can see it right there in claudius maximus and for example he'll think he sometimes thinks of particular instances he was clearly i think about three times he mentions uh, claudius maximus's death and you know or illness now again there's some ambiguity there it looks like he's implying that this guy was ill for a long time and then he died and he he, that seems that this had a big impact on Marcus and it, he pretty much is clear that it's the way that he coped with this as a Stoic that Marcus has left a real imprint on Marcus's memory um, you know like he's, he was thinking if only I, if I ever get sick you know and when I'm dying if I can face it like that guy did you know then that would be something to aspire to it's just little comment hints that like, he doesn't really elaborate on that so some of these things that he says about his family and his teachers he is saying that they embody fundamental stoic uh, traits uh, teachings um, whether or not those individuals actually were stoics whether it was natural or whether it's something they trained in themselves and sometimes it's other things that seem more kind of individualistic or, or personal so there's also an element of repetition in those descriptions um, because he's often seeing similar uh, traits uh, in these people Chris said that Marcus downplays Apollonius's rhetorical ability okay again like a bit of historical context because um, I, I wanted to mention there that I've heard people say that the history or the context is totally irrelevant to understanding the meditations. It's philosophy, it stands or falls on its own. 
I'm as certain as I can be that they're completely wrong about that. There's a lot you can understand about the meditations without knowing any of the historical context, but there are passages in it that just remain cryptic unless you understand what the guy is talking about. There are names of people that are fairly meaningless unless you know who those people actually are that he's he's talking about. So, you know, you can definitely get a lot of the meditations, but without question, you can get more out of it. You can get even more if you understand some of the things and people that he's referring to. I, I think that's kind of obvious. Um, and this is one of those examples, I, I think. He says something odd about Apollonius thought his ability as a teacher um, was, he viewed it as insignificant, like the least of all his talents. And I'm sure I can see what he means by that. Um, and it needs a little bit of explanation, a little bit of history. Marcus was born during the peak of a cultural movement called the Second Sophistic. And at that time, Greek culture was trendy throughout the Roman Empire, basically, particularly with Roman aristocrats and particularly the imperial court of Hadrian where it was full of these guys that were sophists, they were professional teachers and the thing about a lot of them was that they basically travelled around and they were, the most famous sophists were very much celebrities. Um, they actually wielded a lot of power, they became immensely wealthy and they would write speeches, they would write poetry, they would have kind of salons, but they would also give these huge public lectures attended by many hundreds of people. And they, they had wealthy patrons. So there were a bunch of these guys, like you, kind of like you read about in ancient Greece as well, but during Marcus's lifetime, and they weren't all bad. You know, we sometimes see an opposition between philosophy and uh, and sophistry but you know um, he, Socrates was friends with some of the sophists Marcus was friends with a number of sophists um, but they did have a kind of difference of values the the sophists by the very nature of their profession sought celebrity and acclaim um, they they competed against each other they sought to impress large audiences. It, um, you know, it was it was all about winning praise, winning literally winning applause, and uh, in particular, many of them, like I said, became celebrities and made a lot of money out of it. And I think Marcus's comments have to be understood in that light. And so when he talks about Apollonius, his really his main sort of formal Stoic teacher. Uh, Marcus is kind of implying, look, this guy was naturally a gifted speaker, but he he didn't care um, to pursue that. Um, he didn't go out seeking to be celebrated as a great speaker, uh, a great public speaker. He was more interested in the content of what he was teaching. Uh, Apollonius more interested in like in substance rather than style, as it were. So I think. You know, again, a little bit about the, cult, the historical cultural context sheds a bit of light on you know this very brief, slightly cryptic little comment. Uh, Alexander talked about how Marcus mentions Claudius Maximus remaining cheerful in all circumstances, if I remember rightly. And actually, I, f I think that's the phrase he uses about Maximus, but he says something very similar, doesn't he, about Apollonius? He talks about the loss of his children and, and going through a long illness as well. So again, I I think that very brief remark really hits home and it shines a light on a, a trait that, that's almost universally admired and that happens to be integral to Stoicism. And you know, I think when we're understanding Stoicism, it's very useful to shift back between our the sort of individual perspective and thinking about other people's behaviour and values. And the, the Stoics did that. And I think it's an important way of, of really working through the ethics, clarifying the values. Um, and here Marcus is looking at people that endured illness and thinking, you know, what do I really admire about them? And he was thinking, these are the kind of people that managed to remain cheerful and get on with their lives, 
even when they're enduring pain and illness. You know, the kind of people that are really inspiring in that respect. And, you know, sometimes people are a little bit unsure about the, the idea of kind of indifference towards pain and so on. But when they look at other people and ask themselves what's praiseworthy, what's admirable, like, then it becomes clearer. Yeah, the sort of people that don't let pain stop them in the tracks, like, that go on with things despite it, like, those are the sort of people that we tend to admire. And then Marcus is asking himself, what would it be like if I was more like Maximus or Apollonius in that regard? And incidentally, I think, now we're a little bit more in the realm of speculation, but in, in my opinion, uh, I think Mark has changed in that regard. I think if we look at the letters to Fronto, hard to date, but mainly um, written during his early reign and his tenure as Caesar. Um, and then we compare that to the meditations and also some of the stuff that we, we hear in the histories. I think we can see that Mark has changed over time and that he kind of seems to have become tougher in a sense and his attitude towards pain looks like it, it transformed um, probably because he didn't have any choice but to figure out how he was going to deal with it and he used stoicism decades further down the line after decades of training in stoicism and, and um, observing stoics and modelling them and writing about it you know, he seems to have arrived at a different attitude towards uh, his own chronic pain and, and suffering. Brennan mentions this phrase about being resolute and yielding. I think that's referring to the reserve clause, maybe. I can't be sure, but it sounds like it may be a reference to the reserve clause, which is the idea that someone should be resolutely committed to action while nevertheless being prepared to yield or adapt without grumbling about it. Um, if they fail or there are setbacks that thwart them. I like the, the metaphor, incidentally, about different metals. Brennan mentioned, um, we might say that the stoic wise man prefers to be free from pain, fate permitting, with the reserve clause, but that if he does have to endure pain, he yields to that fact, accepts the sensations without grumbling, and resolutely gets on with life, it would be one way of maybe framing that. Uh, thinking about how the reserve clause might apply to, to pain. The strategies. How do Stoics cope with pain and illness? Um, there's so much that we could say about this. So even this course, which is fairly in-depth, um, there, there is more to this subject. Um, there are other strategies and stuff. but And each one we could go into in a lot more detail. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot in the course. I don't know, also, by the way, you may have noticed, people are asking me about, um, like, if I do voluntary hardship and stuff. I'm, I've been fairly lucky in terms of pain. I do have some health issues that, that like, cause me a lot of chronic pain that I have to cope with. Uh, I haven't had a lot of surgery or dentistry and stuff like that over the years. Um, but I do a couple of things where I try and practice voluntary hardship. Like, I love having cold showers. I probably enjoy them too much. Maybe it's not a hardship. Um, I feel like they wake me up in the morning. I had to practice my pain management strategies, ironically this week, because I had a four hour tattoo session um, and I suddenly realized that I had probably gonna have to use some of the strategies that we were talking about this week. So that, that helped. And pain management often has practical benefits. So the tattooist was kind of saying to me as well, look some people fidget a lot and it makes it really hard to you know not make mistakes um because they keep moving and stuff and she was saying yeah like if you you're dealing with the pain and you remain still then you'll get a better tattoo out of it um in the discussion wilfred had said would marcus approve of taking ibuprofen a painkiller and i some people have mentioned this already marcus took theriac which was this famous herbal remedy I guess you would it was really a concoction made of like 20 or 30 different ingredients there are different recipes for it um, it's a very old traditional recipe it must have been very expensive uh, emperors took it to as a preventative to build up resistance to being poisoned I, I you know who knows if it had any benefits in that regard but we're told actually that's not why Marcus took it, but he seems to have taken it to help with his health problems, his chronic pain, and his 
uh, insomnia as well. So this would be a good example of an indifferent, where Stoics would say it's acceptable to use painkillers within reason or within certain bounds. Just like, think of it as compared to food. Food is morally indifferent, but the wise man eats in an appropriate way. He eats an appropriate amount within reasonable bounds. He doesn't eat too much um, or too little. And what's reasonable is going to vary depending on the situation, uh, on the individual. So, you know, this isn't a pure moral duty. It's uh, an area where judgments of probability and a degree of uncertainty comes into play. It's a little bit of a fuzzy area about what's an appropriate behaviour in the situation. The precise limit with these things varies. Um, all things in moderation, nothing in excess, said the inscription at Delphi. Uh, Socrates quotes that, like, that's essentially, you know, something that the, the Stoics would have considered a, a moral slogan. Um, on the other hand, having no limits and abusing painkillers uh, would be a vice. Uh, that would be the opposite of moderation. So the wise man has to carefully judge what's most healthy for his body in the long term and avoid doing anything inconsistent with virtues like prudence and moderation. Timothy mentions fasting. Healthy fasting, again in moderation, uh, would be a convenient way for people today to develop tolerance of discomfort and self-discipline. It would be a good example of voluntary hardship, endure and renounce. Um, at the start of the Peloponnesian War, Socrates served as an Athenian hoplite, a heavy, heavy infantryman, in the siege of Potidaea, uh, which lasted three years. And although the, the Athenians were laying siege, they were kind of surrounded and the supplies were cut off and they ended up starving. And Socrates kind of became famous as a military hero uh, for other reasons during that conflict, but partly also in respect, um, apparently also from uh, the, like, the the officers, um, because he he trained himself to go without food, and so he coped much better when people around him were starving than, than others did. And I, I don't know if this is stated explicitly, but I think the implication is that some people would have surrendered because they freaked out when the supplies were cut off. And, and Socrates was one of the people that stood their ground because he had a greater tolerance for discomfort and was able to like survive on more meagre rations and stuff like that. There's a little, little historical anecdote for you, a little aside. Juan had mentioned cold showers. Um, these are all examples of voluntary discomfort. Seneca mentions having cold baths. A little historical anecdote for you again. Uh, the Roman army actually... T like. For, they use this as shorthand for describing a legion or a, a military unit that has just gone to the dogs. Like so, the the Roman generals would say they those guys, the Eastern legions, bathe in warm water, and you can feel the kind of disgust emanating from them when they say when they make these comments like they just think that's like pathetic you know like they, these are lead these troops have gone to the dogs because they're bathing in warm water so this was part of roman culture actually um although seneca seems to kind of think of it in relation to his stoicism i kind of wonder where whether marcus would have had cold baths and stuff though because he was stationed with the military but he we're also told in a couple of ways that he his symptoms were made worse by the cold like so i kind of feel he may actually have been too sort of physically frail to have you know been bathing in ice water and things like that he may have had breathing problems um, I think, for instance, in one of the histories, we were told that he had problems addressing the troops, like he's projecting his voice and speaking loudly because of the climate in Pannonia, Austria. Um, Bob talks about the pros and cons of some of these strategies, and he drew up a list with some comments. I think that's great. I I kind of wanted to phrase this by saying, like, here's what it's sometimes useful to it's useful to look at what people do when they fail to benefit from psychological techniques. Like one of the things I've thought about many years 
uh, many times over the years as a therapist is what, what happens when therapy goes wrong? You know, what happens with, what's going on with clients that don't really benefit from therapy? And one of the answers is that um, people often, when they're looking for ways to cope with anxiety or pain, um, either they'll adopt bad strategies um, or they'll kind of not really look at the full range of strategies available to them. So usually there's a bunch, you know, like a dozen or, or, or so strategies that other people use that, you know, and some of them are good and some of them are bad, some of them are evidence-based, some of them might actually be counterproductive. And so first thing is that people do it in an uninformed way or also they don't really look at the range of strategies that are available. But another thing that people do wrong is that they don't think about the pros and cons of the individual strategies that they're considering using or the ones that they're already using. And one way of doing that would be that they think about the disadvantage of a technique and then just discount it completely. So they go, I'm not going to do that, it takes too long. Like, so relaxation techniques might be useful. Eh, I'm not going to do that, I haven't got the time for it. Like, it's disadvantage. Whereas it's useful to systematically think, okay, what are the pros? What are the cons of this technique? Short term, long term? Um, for each of the pros, how could I squeeze more out of that? How can I make it more likely I'm going to obtain it? For each of the disadvantages, how can I make them less likely to happen or eliminate them or minimize their impact? You know, and just kind of think it through to a, a slightly, to go a, a stage further in terms of evaluating the technique. And I, I, I think Bob had kind of gone into that a little bit, you know, thinking about the pros and cons of some of the techniques and, you know, how they might be tweaked a little bit. For example, if you think relaxation techniques too, take too long, you could abbreviate them and do them multiple times throughout the day. So just have like mini relaxations three or four times a day. Or you, people, or what do other people do? They'll listen to an audio recording in their bed at night, um, or they'll incorporate relaxation techniques while they're doing something else. They might practice relaxation while they're listening to a podcast. So you, you know, what do other people do to get around that con or disadvantage to the strategy? You know, that's just part of problem solving. Um, but it's useful to mention that I think when we are thinking about these stoic techniques. So you'll see a list of stoic techniques and you'll think, I like that one, I don't like that one, I like that one. And there might be ones that you abandon because you kind of think, well, I can see a problem with doing that. But go, just take time to go a stage further and think, you know, if there's a disadvantage, a negative to using the strategy, is there a way that I could get around that? How would other people get around that con or disadvantage? Uh, Brennan had mentioned there's less content in week three than the other weeks. Actually, yeah, you're right about that. I, I think it kind of increases again in a bit in, in week four. It, it's a bit longer. So week, week three, for some week, for some reason, is a little bit shorter. It may just be the way things are divided up. Maybe I took stuff out of it. I'm not sure. I can't remember now. Um, but, yeah, again, generally people want it to be a little bit more compressed. Um, I may add more content to week three. If you're looking for more stuff... I shared a link in the discussion to a podcast called Living With Pain that three of us from Modern Stoicism did. So I did a podcast about CBT and Stoicism and Pain. I think I talk about acceptance and commitment therapy in it. And uh, Greg Sadler and William Irvin uh, also talk about Stoicism and Pain uh, in separate podcasts. There are three of them. So there's a link to that in the discussion if you want to go back and look at it. Okay, so that was a little bit about the discussion points that we had for pain and illness in week three. What's going to happen in week four? Well, it's about loss and transience and mortality and stuff. So, you know, like, looking forward to doing pain. Like, we're now, I guess we're going beyond pain and illness now towards, like, death and stuff. But also loss of... of Loss in general in the broadest sense, but also bereavement is a part of this. So I would say that week four for some people, I've not found this to be a problem so far, but for some people it could be 
um, that it kind of hits a nerve. Um, I can imagine that if someone had recently been bereaved, that it, the maybe just some of the anecdotes and stuff could be kind of heavy for them. So I, I just mention that. I mean, in a way, that's self-evident, you know, because you, you, I guess you know going into it that that's like what the material is about. Um, but if there's anyone doing the course that's kind of, you know, that these are sensitive uh, issues for, you know, just be just be wary. Um, um, be cautious that when you're going into it, it's going to be talking a lot about death and bereavement and stuff. So you have the video. Uh, there's the excerpt in week four, which is a really interesting passage where Marcus lists five ways in which he says the soul injures itself when it resents events that befall it, when it wants to harm another person through hate or anger, when it's thrown off course by pain or pleasure, he says, when it's phony or insincere, untruthful, uh, or when it lives aimlessly. Uh, so those are all kind of typical Stoic teachings. They're just formulated in a slightly different list. It's an interesting little list. I know that some people kind of, it's one of those things that they like to take away with them and, you know, use as a little aid memoir or something. So it might be useful. There's an article here. I, this, I love this article. I did the, like, the audio for it recently. Um, Sometimes we, I found that I had to kind of research a bit further, think a little bit further to find links between Marcus's philosophy and his biography. Uh, they're there, but maybe not obvious at first. And sometimes when you dig a lot deep, a little bit deeper, there's like a whole kind of torrent of bits that connect together. And then sometimes you've got to stretch things a little bit. And then there's other areas where, in the standard scholarship and the subject, people can't help but repeatedly join two dots together if that makes sense and the article here about the river of time is a classic example of that anybody that's read the meditations and studied it in depth you know and even just has the basic concept that Marcus was writing a lot of this at Carnuntum like knows a little bit about the context any scholars that have written about this will tend to say he doesn't say this explicitly but there are frequent references to this cliche of the river of time in the meditations and he even kind of goes beyond it a little bit and he talks about sparrows flitting along the river bank and stuff and it's hard if you have a if you're really immersed in it it's hard to read that and not think he must have been talking about the Danube like as well as it being a, a, a well established uh, cliched philosophical figure of speech he, he's beside a huge river when he's writing it um, and so there's, there's got to be some kind of link in Marcus's mind and he does have this habit of taking things from his own experience like observing wrestling uh, wild boar hunting and turning all these things into metaphors for philosophy so this section looks at all the references that Marcus makes to rivers and streams and then it talks a little bit and it, it throws in a few anecdotes about what was kind of going on in terms of the river I mean the Marcomannic War was essentially fought across the river it, it, I, mean, I, mean, like, I mean back and forwards over the river it, the river essentially the Romans often uh, used natural boundaries like mountain ranges or rivers to mark frontiers because um, it's a, a natural uh, defensive uh, like resource. And he, so like this whole war basically revolves around this big river. And Marcus commanded a fleet on the river as well. So there's some interesting stuff. I mean, even Cassius Dio, when he's talking about Marcus, at one point just breaks off at a tangent. And I've included this as well. And goes into this really weird little digression about Roman pontoon building. Like, but it, it, it's a little bit off at a tangent, but it, it kind of illustrates the technology the Romans were using and how, you know, the, there was a lot going on here. There's a lot of military strategy that revolves around the river. Um, and it's a big part in Marcus's life and so these philosophical reflections that, he's, that he has about transience and loss I think when we kind of link them 
to his circumstances. They just become more resonant, memorable, meaningful. There's that famous passage where he says um, it, that he talks about uh, life being warfare in a sojourn in a foreign land. And then he goes on to talk about the everything to do with the body being like a, a, a river, a stream flowing away. And that passage in particular, any scholars that have looked at it have went, he re- that really sounds like it's reflecting his environment uh, like in these uh, legionary bases along the river. Because he, he was in, literally in a foreign land uh, and engaged in a war. Like, so it's, you know, when we see that context, it, it kind of jumps out. Um, he he's obviously referring also to Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic philosopher, and there is this curious thing that you know he's like the fifth beetle or something. He's he's there in the background, and often you know we we don't talk a lot about his relationship with Stoicism, but Marcus is clearly a follower of Epictetus. He quotes Epictetus a number of times. But the per- the other person that he quotes almost as much is Heraclitus, and there are even passages where he seems to be kind of combining references to them, like welding them together. Like he's kind of saying these are my two main influences. Almost Heraclitus and Epictetus, bang, put those two things together. You've got Marcus's, uh, you know, brand of stoicism, if you like. And there's not a lot of reference to Heraclitus in Epictetus, but he does mention him in passing and he praises him very highly. So it may be that he discussed them in some of the missing discourses, for all we know. It's, you know, again, this is an area where you just will never know. When Marcus talks about him, I think it's unlikely that he'd read the original book by Heraclitus on nature, but all the references he makes to them are probably coming from other philosophical texts commenting on him. Um, you know, I'm guessing Stoic texts that that discuss his philosophy in more detail. Although you know, they they could be other types of texts. Um, so this is a big part of understanding it. Like this idea that everything is constantly changing, and we should view life as like a river that's constantly in flux. Um, what Epictetus says in that passage is that you know he his interpretation of this is that viewing things in this way, adopting this kind of metaphysical view that emphasizes the transience of material things, allows us to become less psychologically attached to externals. It's a, a philosophy of impermanence or transience, pantare, it's called in Greek, everything flows, uh, predates the earliest written accounts of Buddhist uh, impermanence. Um, what do you call it in Buddhism? Anita? Anicca? Is that right? Anicca Vada? Um, the philosophy of impermanence in Buddhism is something people associate with Buddhism, but it possibly it's even earlier in Greek philosophy, and it's a big part of Greek philosophy. So, you know, this is integral to Marcus's stoicism, and he sees it as a psychological. It's, a f- f- it's part of physics, it's stoic physics or metaphysics. Um, but it serves a psychological purpose. It's there, like the contemplation of transience as a way of becoming less attached to material things. Then there's a section on contemplating loss and mortality. Um, I believe there's an audio recording, by the way, of the, the River of Time section. Uh, thinking about changes being natural and indifferent, remembering our own mortality. And there's a whole barrage of stoic arguments about why death is to be classed as an indifferent. Again, a lot of the stuff in stoicism kind of very obviously owes a lot to Socrates. And the stoics reputedly saw themselves as a Socratic sect. And I'm guessing, I don't think we have an explicit passage where they say this, but it looks like they would pro- they would probably um, have said that you know th- they were getting back to the real Socrates, the original Socrates, um, because it was kind of widely believed that Plato had sort of bastardized Socrates' philosophy to some extent and put his own ideas in Socrates' mouth and taken Pythagoreanism and, and puts that and you know those metaphysical 
concepts in, in Socrates' mouth. Like Socrates probably didn't believe in the theory of forms. You know, that's Plato's stuff. But Plato has him talking about it. And, you know, the Stoics, the early Stoics would have been familiar with other uh, Stoic di uh, Socratic dialogues that came from um, other members of Socrates' circle, uh, like Antisthenes, for example, or Euclid, um, and uh, Xenophon as well. They were really interested in, in his Socratic dialogues. So th I, I think the Stoics would have seen themselves as reconstructing, um, you know, the real Socrates, as it were, from these multiple sources. And, you know, like when they talk about mortality, uh, Socrates is their number one role model. And throughout the whole of the ancient world, his he was considered to provide the best example of a noble death or a, a good death, um, euthanasia. Uh, and this is very important to the, the Greeks and Romans, like how do we learn how to face death wisely, uh, calmly, philosophically. Socrates provides us a, with a kind of template for that. Uh, then we go into the view from above, which is the big stoic metaphysical vision and we can distinguish between the sort of Olympian view like the gods atop Mount Olympus looking down on things so visualizing things from high above and also this more cosmological perspective which really sort of segues into just the whole field of natural philosophy in the ancient world and trying to understand the universe as a whole and broadening our perspective. And so again, the Stoics thought that doing natural philosophy, doing cosmology and metaphysics was itself a kind of psychological or spiritual exercise. It was entering into the mind of God by trying to, to grasp the, the universe in its totality. Um, and it has psychological benefits. It makes us less attached to, to trivial things. So, you know, there's a real like, intersection of Stoic psychology and Stoic physics, uh, uh, particularly in this vision of the, the view from above, which is the name uh, given to it by Pierre Hadot. Uh, we, we don't know what the Stoics called most of these exercises, or any of them really. Uh, we don't know for sure what they actually called them. There's some, but they, it looks like they have names for them. Um, but this one, it, it, even though it occurs throughout classical literature, there's never really a name attached to it. Um, but Hado calls it the view from above, and that name is kind of stuck. There's some excerpts from Justius Lipsius and uh, Antony, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, which is kind of a, a different thing. I just wanted to, we haven't got scope to go into those authors, um, that takes us too far away from Marcus, but I wanted to just bring them in a little bit to give you a flavour of, you know, there there are early modern Stoic writers as well. Um, Justus Lipsius, the founder of Neo-Stoicism at the start of the 17th century, and just a little bit later, at the start of the 18th century, the, the Earl of Shaftesbury, one of my favourite books on Stoicism, The Philosophical Regimen, um, is not well read at all like the, the very few people that read that book but if you like the meditations you simply must read it because he had a very thorough knowledge of and made a close study of the Greek of the meditations and Epictetus' discourses and he re he does his own version of the meditations and he draw it's both an early modern Version, um, like a uh, alternate, like he did, he writes his own meditations in the kind of in the style of Marcus Aurelius's meditations, uh, Stoic meditations, but it's also a, serves as a, a great commentary on Marcus and Epictetus. So the philosophical regimen that book's called. Definitely read it if you if you're really into the meditations. As long as you're okay with reading early modern literature, you know it, it maybe seems a, a little bit antiquated to, to some modern readers. It requires a lot of patience, but if you're into that stuff, it's a brilliant book. Then we have the audio exercise of The View From Above, which is like the most popular um, Stoic guided meditation, certainly. Um, it was really the thing that kind of got me into teaching Stoicism. Um, I was doing some workshops, pretty much in the same form, it hasn't changed a lot over the years. And I made recordings of it because that's what I do. And people really liked it and it grew. Uh, Patrick Usher, who uh, was a PhD student at 
Exeter University. He was doing some work with uh, Professor Chris Gill, uh, his emeritus professor of ancient thought. And they were trying to live like Galen for a week and follow Galen's advice. And Patrick and some of the other students heard the recording that I'd uploaded, similar to that one. And they listened to it in their group and they were like, well, maybe we could live like Marcus Aurelius. Maybe we could live like a Stoic for a week. And so that's kind of how modern Stoicism, the whole project, originated. Incidentally, kind of to some extent with that recording. You've, you've, this is actually a re-recording of it, so it's kind of cleaned up and improved and stuff. So hopefully it's a kind of you know slightly better quality. Like it's it was rephrased slightly, the recording was redone and stuff. It's gone through a couple of versions actually. Number uh, the next section then is the, the discussion about coming to terms with loss and mortality. What are the pros and cons of focusing on the transience of things and accepting mortality as a fact of life. You know it's just a, a pretty heavy question in a way, and people. You know, one of the advantages of doing philosophy is just the almost privilege of being able to ask these really heavy questions, and you know, and and having other people that are willing to talk about how they their personal experience and their personal feelings about you know these pretty deep questions. It, you know, it's it's great just to be able to pose these things and uh, and see what people say. If you look at the previous discussion from the pilot course as well, you'll see some people kind of saying very honest and very insightful things about these often quite simple but penetrating questions. In a way that was the essence of Socratic philosophy. Socrates came along and asked people, you know, really deep, fundamental, penetrating questions and, you know, so they made them drink hemlock. Right. Xenophon talks about how some people were like, wow, that's heavy, you know, I really want to discuss that. And then other people just got really frustrated and annoyed with Socrates. Hopefully everyone in this course is up for discussing like, these uh, pretty intense questions. And then the, there's a bonus section which is about the Civil War. Um, there's also an audio recording where I, I talk about the view from above in Marcus Aurelius actually. Uh, so we've got the audio scripted guided meditation and there's also an audio recording where I'm talking about excerpts from Marcus Aurelius because I feel that that also has a kind of contemplative... You can't read about the view from above without kind of entering into it in some ways. That's the, the mystery, the beauty of it. The section in the Civil War, really mainly just because it deals with this stage to, in the, the latter section of Marcus's life, the last five years of Marcus's life, um, when you know he had the Civil War that only lasted three months, and how he dealt with it. So that's more like, a, that, that's, that was actually part of a proposal for a book that kind of got shelved uh, or mutated into a very different sort of book. But there's a, a chapter there which is uh, kind of written in the style of uh, historical fiction. Um, but it's, based, it's very closely based on what the histories tell us about Vidius Cassius and the events surrounding the Civil War. So that will be a little bit of a different experience. It's more like reading a novel or something. Um, similar to the chapter about the Antonine Plague, actually, and so hopefully you you know you'll find that interesting. Uh, it's a different way of approaching the subject, maybe maybe appeal more to some individuals. And uh, you know by this point, Marcus is a military hero. The Northern Legions completely adored him. This has again been this kind of transformation in his life. When he went to war, he had never served in the army. Like they must have thought, who is this guy? You know, um, but at this point, when the civil war out breaks out, the the legions just seem to absolutely adore him, and he's, you know, he's now got this status as a kind of military veteran and a, a highly regarded uh, commander in chief. They attribute two famous battlefield miracles to his presence, and they're really interesting as well. So there's a little bit of discussion about that. And then the way that Marcus responds to this crisis of the Civil War is, is fascinating as well. Uh, it really relates more to Stoic empathy and uh, premeditation of adversity and that kind of stuff, the interpersonal stuff. But it, it's a really interesting example of Stoicism being applied in action. So hopefully you'll, that's bonus material, it's kind of an added extra, but hopefully you'll find that interesting. And that is then the end of the course we'll do another webinar like i said and i'll do and ask me anything about marcus aurelius to wrap things up and uh, i'm sure there's probably some content that you still haven't delved into that you can go back you'll have lifetime access 
and go back and look at it again. When the course runs again in about six months' time, I'll be doing another series of webinars and you'll be invited to those if you want to tune into them again. So feel free to do that. So uh, we're kind of reaching the end for today. So I'm just going to quickly have a look at the chat and see if we've got any specific questions. Like the tattoo, good. Uh, to work through the content, it's just you separate your history of the temple. Yeah, like we could do, I don't know. Like, I feel like, do we want to separate the history from the other stuff? Maybe. I'll have a think about that. Let, other people can maybe let me know if you want the, there to be a kind of more of a separation between the history. I feel like one of the benefits of the course is intertwining those things actually. But, you know, maybe that's something we can discuss. I'm pretty flexible about course design, by the way. You know, I just, um, you know, I base it on feedback from students, but bear in mind that there are hundreds of students, so like you, you may feel very strongly that something should work in a certain way, but maybe a bunch of other people that say the opposite. And so, as the course designer and facilitator, I kind of need to try and reach some sort of compromise between uh, different perspectives. What's Marcus's take on our natural tendency to assign negative values to pain and our natural tendency to assign positive values to pleasure? Gifts in that they are opportunities to exercise virtue. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's the stoic take on it. Pain and pleasure are indifferent. Why do we naturally perceive them otherwise? I I mean, the stoics actually dispute this. They because the hedonists said this all the time. And the stoics say, well, look, even in animal nature, you can see... Um, for example, the uh, a female bear, or you know, like many other creatures, not all species obviously, but like many other uh, species of mammals, like the the parents, often the mother, um, will risk her life and injury to defend her offspring. And the Stoics would say, well, like, I mean, if she was motivated by the avoidance of pain, for example, as her supreme goal, like, then why would she uh, endure injury and, and pain defending her offspring? There's clearly another instinct that takes priority and it's more fundamental and it has to do with, then the Stoics want to argue that has to do with what we call natural affection. So they, they want to say, like, this isn't even this idea that the hedonists have that, you know, all animals fundamentally are driven by pleasure and pain isn't really accurate. And, uh, you know, what they, they would say that to some extent, um, these things have a very powerful pull over us. Um, but the Stoics answer to virtually all of these sort of questions is that with the acquisition of reason, which they say, well, we, we don't, we're, we're not exercising reason and self-consciousness at birth. Um, as we get older, um, the Stoics believe we, we kind of mature, we become more, we learn how to speak and we develop self-consciousness, our psychological abilities develop through childhood and then there's this kind of progressive uh, development of um, adult capability for reasoning and, and the Stoics say that transforms these natural instincts. So, you know, we may instinctively be averse to pain to some extent and drawn to pleasure to some extent but I mean very simply once we're capable of reasoning about things we can take a step back and say even though this thing tastes very pleasant and I want to eat it maybe it's bad for my health and I shouldn't and the Stoics say we're capable now of re-evaluating those instincts and that's what wisdom consists in wisdom is a, it consists in our ability to question our instincts and the way that we respond to pain and pleasure. Uh, someone else asking, where did you get all the detail on the Antonine Plague? From the Roman histories and from a bunch of modern biographies about it, basically. Uh, and a lot, I researched a lot of different sources actually, but a lot of the information is contained in the various modern biographies which are all listed in the reading list in the course actually um, and you know like looking closely at the original uh, Roman histories is important as well The Philosophical Regimen yeah, is a book by the Earl of Shaftesbury people yeah, discussing to what extent you want to separate stuff okay You described the development of executive functioning in the frontal lobe 
Um, yeah, we, uh, what they call the ruling faculty. I mean, even the word executive function is, you know, obviously sounds like ruling facul faculty, hegemonic on uh, the Stoics say. So, yeah, they, that's pretty much what they mean. Like, they have a word for it and they distinguish it from other psychological facts. It's amazing. Like, they are, they're, their grasp of psychology is weirdly, it's weird how much, more, how much more sophisticated it is than modern folk psychology. Like, the, the understanding that most people have who haven't, like, looked into psychology in any detail. Like, they, they actually understood a bunch of stuff. Um, they understood more about uh, psychotherapy than Freud did. That's the sort, sort of claim that sounds a bit crazy in a way, but I, I believe that. Like, they, the Stoics understood more about psychotherapy than Sigmund Freud did, like, hands down. There's a whole bunch of stuff that modern therapists didn't really embrace until the, the cognitive behavioural revolution in psychotherapy, like in the 50s and 60s and in the following decades. Uh, you know, like Freud had, had no concept of some of the, no concept of cognitive distance. Uh, for example, like, some of the other techniques and strategies that the Stoics had, Freud and his followers, no concept. Like of anything like that, like they were kind of looking in the wrong direction, and these guys knew it two and a, like nearly two and a half thousand years ago. Like it's remarkable. Okay, so let's finish there. Uh, thanks once again for coming along. I uh, hope you enjoy week four. Like, uh, if you've got any questions, you can, as always, post them under the video. In like two or three minutes from now, there'll be a permanent comments section. So, uh, goodbye from me in Nova Scotia, and I look forward to seeing you uh, at the webinar same time next Sunday. Bye.